This is what I'm calling Duple. It's a physical model of a Paul trap, or a quadrupole ion trap, a device which traps charged particles in a flapping electric field. In this series, I'm going to take you through my build process for a project like this. For any design project, I like to break things down into phases. The typical flow is concept, followed by prototyping, followed by production. These phases get broken down into actionable tasks once we start a phase. Often, we don't know enough about the later phases to start nailing down the details of implementation until we really start making things. So first step is concept development, which is essentially what does it do and how do people interact with it? Taking a step back and starting at the beginning of the process, I need to flesh out what Duple is. At its core, Duple is a desk toy which uses gravity and a rotating curved surface to trap a ball in place. The goal here is a primarily aesthetic one, since this is a desk toy. The only functional requirement is that the ball must actually be captured in the center of the device. The mechanism of action is well documented, and we'll go into the math in the next section. One of the questions that naturally comes up in concept development is, how will a person use it? The interface, or how the user interacts with the item, is by placing the ball into the spinning curve. Since this is a desktop item, it should have a simple interface. I'm imagining an active and a resting position, essentially an on and an off. For this device, I think removing the ball or the ball falling off is a good time for the device to stop spinning. To trigger the device turning on, we could implement a simple switch or try to do something more interesting. While brainstorming ideas, the idea of having lifting the ball up be the thing that triggers the spinning to start came up. This has the added benefit of giving the motor a second to get up to speed. Now for the supporting math, or how does it actually work? I'll link to the research paper and the original video that inspired this video by Action Lab for those that are interested in the governing equations. The goal of the duple is to simulate the trapping phenomenon that occurs on charged particles in a Paul trap field. In the Paul trap, four electrical potentials, two positive and two negative, are arranged at the corners of a square. The magnetic potential this creates can be represented by a series of arrows showing the direction of push or pull a particle experiences. A particle placed near one of the positive poles is pushed to the center. A particle placed near the center is pulled off of the center by the negative poles. This vector field is what we want to represent mechanically instead of electrically. One question that arises is why not use all positive poles? This would appear to fully trap the particle by always pushing it towards the center. The answer to this is literally Nobel Prize winning and a bit beyond the scope of this video. The short answer is by introducing a negative component and flipping between the polarities, a stable system can be achieved. This flipping of the polarities can be indicated by the vector field flipping directions. Since we're really only interested in the center of the graph, we can remove the electromagnetic poles and only keep the vector field. Since we are attempting to represent this field with a rigid physical part, we can also pause the switching action and examine just a snapshot of the vector field. We've got one direction that pulls the ball towards the center and another that pushes it off a hill. Each of these forces is strong near the poles, but weakens near the center. Let's hold on to that thought for a moment. Now, we're gonna dive into the math here, but don't be scared. Math is often taught in classrooms with a focus on computing answers. Out in the real world, math is simply a tool used to describe the world. We're trying to describe a dynamic electrical potential with physical parts. Math just happens to be the most convenient and accurate way to do this. We take a slice of this potential surface and start experimenting with the math, we can get a visual understanding of how it's gonna behave. A constant number gives us just a horizontal line, which doesn't really push the ball in any particular direction. Tilting the line does get the ball to roll downhill, but the slope stays constant. We want a curve that gets weaker as we approach the center. Quadratic functions are some of the simplest curves found in nature. Plotting x squared, we can see it satisfies the requirements. It gets stronger as you get further away from the center. Inverting the equation and switching to the y-axis gives us negative y squared, which satisfies the opposite requirement. Plotting these equations separately in 3D gives us two orthogonal parabolas. Blending them together by adding them gives us the surface we are after, which can be stated as z equals x squared minus y squared. This surface is called a hyperbolic paraboloid, or a saddle curve. The math is just a model of real-world phenomena. It's a way to describe how things already work. 
To describe the saddle curve shown here, I could call it a Pringle, and a decent number of people would understand the reference, but we wouldn't be able to do anything with that information. I can type in z equals x squared minus y squared into a computer and plot the resulting surface. I can't really type Pringle shape into a computer and expect a surface. So we have a surface that roughly simulates the behavior we want. Half of it attracts the particle to the middle, the other half repels the particle from the middle. In the Paul trap, these forces are balanced by cycling the poles. This is often visualized as the surface we've been working with flapping between a high and low potential. The paper goes into more detail on the supporting math, but the core concept is that if we spin the surface we've generated, we can approximate the forces generated by the flapping field with a rigid surface. We can visualize this by plotting a line where the flapping surface intersects with a arbitrary plane. Now I'll hide the surface, but keep the curve going. This represents a slice of the forces a particle would experience. Now I'll introduce the rotating field. We can see the curve and the rotating surface actually track very nicely, which is exactly what we want. This means we can approximate the complex flapping of the Paul trap by simply spinning a static shape. The next question that comes up is how fast should it spin? If the saddle spins too slowly, the ball will fall off because the force that attracts the ball to the center won't come around fast enough to act on the ball. But at the other end of the spectrum, if it spins too quickly, it's likely to throw balls across the room. So there's probably a happy medium. Now onto the initial bill of materials and you know what is actually needed to make it. Turning this into a physical item that we can make, we're going to need some material for the parabolic surface, a particle, electronics to spin the device at a specific speed, and a method to detect the ball being picked up. I really like the look of walnut and brass, so I plan on using that for the parabola and other visual parts. For the particle, I'm going to start with a hollow brass ball. For the electronics, I plan on using a small microcontroller to manage all the inputs and outputs, a photoresistor to detect if the ball has been picked up, and a small stepper motor to spin the saddle. To drive the motor, I know I'm going to need a stepper motor driver, and I plan on kind of powering this whole thing with USB-C. At this point in a project, I like to do some quick 3D rendering to understand what the final object is going to look like. So once we know roughly what the components are going to be, we can start playing with them in space. I know I want to machine this on my pocket NC, so that caps the size of the parabola to about four inches by four inches. The stepper is pretty large, so I'll probably want to tuck that in under the parabola. Other than that, I know I would like a ball storage position when the device is off. This will set the general shape of the finished product. Bringing this into CAD, I can start playing around with how I want to integrate the walnut. Reviewing the design I settled on, brass being laminated in between some layers of walnut horizontally, I really like the pattern that emerges on the surface with brass. But with that, I think we have a solid concept to proceed with in the next video. The plan is to create a brass and wood saddle, develop some electronics to spin it at a specific speed, and hope it all works as intended. In the next video, I'll dive into the details of actually designing the parts to work together and beta testing the design by 3D printing a version to validate it works. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date with this project and projects like it. See you next time. Bye.